Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on Special Act 22-8, the Task Force to Study Hydrogen. Um, we are recording today's presentation, and we will post it on the RFP section of the Green Bank's website for further reference. Um, we are also taking questions throughout today's presentation, so please feel free to put them into the question panel um, throughout, and there's a, a time at the end where we will answer those questions. So without any further introduction, I'm going to turn things over to Green Bank President and CEO, Brian Garcia. All right, thank you, Rudy. Thank you for uh, getting us launched here, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are also joined by Sarah Harari on our team and Blair Backman on our team. So uh, as we get into some questions, there may be areas where uh, they can help us cover some ground as well. Uh, but just really excited to be here with you this afternoon as we talk about the request for proposals that the Green Bank has put out uh, specifically to support the task force to study hydrogen, uh, given the special act that passed uh, just recently. Um, why don't we go to the next slide, Rudy? I wanted to start off with an introduction of the Connecticut Green Bank. Uh, many of you out there probably uh, know who we are, but let me just dive into it a little bit more. Uh, we are a quasi-public organization of the state of Connecticut. Uh, I like to describe that as a public sector-driven organization that gets to use private sector disciplines. Uh, so we are focused on social and environmental profit as opposed to financial profit. Um, we also you know, sit in between the public policy of the state and markets, and it's our job to translate the very ambitious public policy objectives of our legislature and executive branch, whether that is a, a greenhouse gas reduction target, uh, including what passed recently with the zero carbon electric sector by 2040 target, uh, or renewable portfolio standards, or you know, all of the above you are all very familiar with. Um, state level uh, aggressive clean energy and climate change goals. So our job is to really translate those aggressive public policy goals to the capital markets to draw their investment into Connecticut so that we could achieve those ambitious targets. Uh, we focus on financing clean energy. Uh, per our definition uh, in statute, that includes renewable energy, energy efficiency, alternative fuel vehicles and associated infrastructure. Um, everything we can kind of think of in Connecticut, it does include fuel cells because we've got a domestic, a very strong domestic uh, stationary fuel cell manufacturing industry here in the state. Um, recently, last year at about this time, our scope was expanded beyond clean energy to include environmental infrastructure. So we're currently in the process of developing our uh, mission goals, objectives around how we're going to enable more private investment in environmental infrastructure, which includes things like uh, land conservation, parks and recreation, uh, agriculture, water, waste and recycling. So anything you could think of that involves the green economy, uh, whether it's clean energy or environmental infrastructure, uh, we probably will eventually capture it. Um, so the legislature wants us to apply the green bank model to see if we can uh, do what we've done for clean energy to unlock private investment in environmental infrastructure. Uh, on the clean energy side, we're supported by a system benefit fund, uh, the Clean Energy Fund, uh, that came to us as a result of electric deregulation in the late 90s. That's what created the Clean Energy Fund. It is a tenth of a penny per kilowatt hour. Uh, that is about seven to ten dollars per family per year. That aggregates to about 25 million dollars. Uh, that number has come down over the last 10 years uh, from about 28 million, which is good. That means we're helping families and businesses reduce uh, energy consumption and become more efficient with their clean energy utilization. Um, we also receive 23% of the REGI allowance proceeds. Uh, and we can invest those allowance proceeds in zero emission clean energy per uh, our statutory definition. Uh, so those are some of the public resources we receive. Uh, our mission is to confront climate change. Uh, you could think of that as obviously reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but now with our environmental infrastructure um, uh, authority, you could also think of it as uh, protecting uh, Connecticut families and businesses from the impacts of climate change that we're experiencing. So uh, think of it as mitigation and adaptation too. Uh, why don't we go to the next slide? Um, this is just a quick snapshot of uh, the first decade of the Green Bank. Uh, 
Uh, over this last 10 years, we received about $290 million of public revenues from those two sources that I mentioned, uh, which helped attract uh, over $1.8 billion of private investment into Connecticut's economy. So $7 of private to every $1 of public. And, you know, the conventional model is, um, you know, public resources uh, being given out as grants. Uh, we actually loan those funds out, so it sits on our balance sheet as a non-current asset. Uh, it gets paid back over time and also generates interest income uh, that covers our operating expense. So a bit different for government uh, to be doing that, but that is uh, the Green Bank model uh, to utilize taxpayer resources in a different way that mobilizes more private investment to fill gaps. Um, we've helped to create over 25,000 jobs in our communities, generating over $110 million of tax revenues from uh, sales tax, uh, corporate tax, individual tax. Uh, we're going to be focusing on property tax uh, this year and uh, quantifying that benefit. Uh, on the energy side, we've helped to deploy more than 500 megawatts primarily behind the meter renewable energy. Uh, over 60 million MMBTUs of energy efficiency uh, savings as a result of efficiency investments over the life of those, uh, those measures. On environmental protection, uh, we're helping to avoid uh, nearly 10 million metric tons of CO2 over the life of the measures. Uh, we're also reducing uh, air pollution, local air pollution. Um, we've got tools that help us quantify the associated public health benefits by reducing local air pollution. So we could actually quantify uh, the reduced asthma, heart attack deaths as a result of a poor air quality. Uh, as we clean it up, we can actually calculate the associated public health savings uh, that uh, occurs as a result of cleaner air. Uh, and then equity, uh, we measure how much investment is going to vulnerable communities. Uh, Connecticut has a statutory definition for vulnerable communities uh, that was passed underneath Public Act 20-05 uh, in a special session, fall session of 2020, following uh, Tropical Storm Isaias and its impacts on Connecticut. Um, so, so we track uh, investments in, you know, less than 80% area median income census tracts, uh, environmental justice communities, and the like to make sure that we're, we're allowing the Green Bank model to apply uh, to the most vulnerable. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so that's just all some background on the Connecticut Green Bank, but uh, while you're all he why you are all here uh, has to do with uh, Connecticut's industry in hydrogen and fuel cells. You know, we're really excited uh, to be bringing this RFP out. Uh, we wanna find a partner uh, to be there with us um, as we coordinate this task force per uh, the special act. And this is just a little snapshot of some of the uh, domestic Connecticut located, you know, associations, uh, university programs, uh, fuel cell manufacturing companies, hydrogen production companies. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of potential end uses uh, for hydrogen um, and the deployment of fuel cells. Uh, you will see that um, through this process. Uh, Connecticut, we're excited, um, you know, outside of this process and the focus on what the legislature has designated this committee to study, um, we are also a part of a regional uh, clean hydrogen proposal. Uh, New York will be leading that proposal, uh, but it includes New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. Uh, obviously, we all think that the Northeast is uh, among the leaders in at least innovating and creating these technologies. Uh, and should be at the front of the line in terms of uh, the federal clean hydrogen hubs as they look to deploy uh, the $8 billion uh, in no less than four uh, regional hydrogen hubs. Let's go to the next slide, Rudy. Um, so just quickly on the special act at a high level, um, it establishes this task force to study hydrogen fueled energy in Connecticut's economy and our energy infrastructure. Um, the composition of those on the committee, or excuse me, the task force, uh, includes both ex officio members, you know, um, the commissioner of the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, the chair of the Public Utilities Regulatory Authority, uh, the president of the University of Connecticut, myself, you know, so there are certain positions uh, in organizations that are held that are designated by statute uh, to serve uh, on this uh, task force. Uh, and then there are others that are to be politically appointed members to the task force. And uh, 
uh, when this law was finally signed by the governor on the 23rd of May, uh, the legislature is now working on um, identifying and appointing various members to the task force. And I'll give you a sense of the composition in a second. Uh, but ultimately the deliverable uh, will be uh, a report that would go to the Energy and Technology Committee uh, no later than January 15th of 2023. Um, so uh, this, that's what a lot of this process today is all about. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so the task force, just a little bit more on the composition of the task force. Those that are bolded are the ex officio members that I was referring to. Those that are unbolded are the politically appointed members that are still in process. So we've got uh, six representatives from the electric distribution companies. Uh, I believe um, these are, uh, this would involve uh, obviously Eversource Energy and United Illuminating, uh, but the statute speaks specifically to electric distribution companies serving uh, no less than 17 uh, cities and towns in the state. So that is obviously Eversource. Uh, and then less than uh, uh, 17 towns uh, is uh, avant-grid UI and some of our municipal utilities. But it's trying to bring in members of the electric companies and the gas companies as well. So uh, various political, uh, excuse me, various state reps and senators will be nominating uh, those members of the committee. Uh, there will be a representative from the nuclear power generating facility, you know, obviously, uh, given that Connecticut has committed to Millstone uh, through long-term contracts, uh, and given the fact that uh, the DOE program will be looking at, uh, you know, pink hydrogen, uh, there's an opportunity here for Connecticut and our regional partners to think about uh, the role of nuclear power in hydrogen production. Uh, the representatives of the building trades uh, we will bring, be bringing in to support the workforce development and helping us wrap our arms around that. We will have three representatives from the Connecticut uh, manufacturers of hydrogen fuel uh, technologies um, and fuel cells. Uh, so, you know, we're likely to see fuel cell energy probably. Um, uh, uh, Doosan's new company um, and uh, others that are manufacturing fuel cells or uh, producing hydrogen. Uh, three representatives from environmental groups. Uh, and two members of the Connecticut Hydrogen Fuel Cell Coalition. So stay tuned. Uh, we're working closely with our legislative leaders to get them to make their nominations. All right, let's go to the next slide, which is where we start to dig in a little bit to the RFP. Um, so what we tried to do here uh, within, for those of you who read uh, Special Act 22-8, is just to take the um, various areas, I think there were seven areas uh, underneath that act and try to you know, categorize them a little bit. Um, so the first part uh, is we're likely to have four working groups, uh, one around policy and workforce development. So reviewing the regulations and legislation needed to guide uh, the development uh, of the industry. Um, uh, excuse me. Uh, guiding the development of the industry. Uh, the second, uh, making recommendations for workforce initiatives uh, to prepare the state's workforce for uh, hydrogen fuel, clean energy jobs. Uh, so that is likely going to be one. We still have to work this through with our, our colleagues and partners on the task force, but uh, these bundles uh, and these categorizations seem to make sense. And the goal would be to um, nominate and select chairs or co-chairs to lead uh, these working groups um, alongside the consultant uh, to provide some uh, observations, recommendations, analyses back to the overall task force. Uh, funding, there are three items here that are noted underneath the statute uh, examining how to position Connecticut to take advantage of competitive incentives, obviously uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, recommendations for funding and tax preferences for building hydrogen fueled energy facilities at brownfield sites, uh, through the targeted brownfield development loan program. Uh, one of the first projects that we financed uh, was the Bridgeport uh, Fuel Cell Park. At the time, it was the largest uh, fuel cell in the United States uh, that was on a former uh, brownfield. Uh, so there are opportunities out there uh, for more deployment. Uh, and then lastly, recommendations regarding funding sources for developing uh, energy programs and infrastructure, any sort of other funding. Uh, financing obviously is a big one. We would uh, help weigh in there. Uh, but those are the three items underneath funding. Let's go to the next slide. Then we've got our sources and uses. 
Uh, I think what what makes uh, Connecticut and New England and the Northeast, you know, specifically our Northeast partners that are going into the hydrogen hub really competitive is that we probably all have every source of um, either natural gas, biogas, uh, carbon-free, nuclear, wind, solar, we probably have every source of possible renewable uh, into electrolysis producing hydrogen source that you could imagine collectively together as states. So, uh, you know, the DOE is, is looking at individual sources of hydrogen production, uh, but we probably have all of them uh, within our region, given the fact that, uh, you know, this is an nascent industry uh, for us. We've been all building this uh, hydrogen fuel cell cluster for decades. Um, and uses, you know, what are recommendations for potential end uses of hydrogen fueled energy? So those four areas and those seven categories, uh, the consultant would support the working groups and running analyses, uh, making recommendations that would fold back up to the task force uh, who would then synthesize them uh, and uh, make recommendations from there. One of the other exciting pieces though of the statute is it notes all these things that it shall include those things but not be limited to. So we want you all as you're thinking about bidding in uh, to also note some of the other things that you know within the statute we may not have identified. Um, you know obviously engagement of environmental justice communities is important. We've been hearing a lot about that. Connecticut's very serious about it. Uh, but more recently I think this week the whole Defense Protection Act and the inclusion of fuel cells in that. What does that mean? How can that be used to enable industry development, supply chain development, uh, and the like? So be creative, uh, come up with some ideas. We'd love to present those ideas to the task force and then offer some optional work uh, for the consultants uh, to support those areas on behalf of the task force. Uh, so as I've been alluding to, you'd support the task force and its working groups, You know, not only including the agendas, notes, and minutes, which are really important, uh, but also the behind the scenes, all the legwork, the muscle that has to happen in terms of running the analyses and preparing uh, all those materials. All right, let's go to the next slide. And I think the next slide is the last one before Q&A. This is really the timeline. So you all got the RFP that was issued. Um, the due date is the 13th. Um, we are going to, uh, uh, excuse me, the due date for questions is the 13th. Uh, we're going to post those questions. So if you have any, you know, on today, I think what we will do for today is we're going to record this. We'll make this recording and questions available to anybody who, who wants it. Uh, but feel free to also submit written questions and we'll respond uh, by June 15th as well. Uh, and the, the applications or the uh, RFP submissions will be due June 20th. Uh, we'll turn that around, we think, fairly quickly uh, and let the uh, a winning bidder no by June 30th, and it's the goal to get the contract in place. A lot of it you see in the RFP, actually, in fact, all of it, I think, Blair, uh, in, in the RFP uh, by July, July 11th, so that uh, the contractor can be on board by July 14th, which we expect will be the first meeting of the task force. You might have noticed that uh, uh, we had anticipated having the first meeting next week, but uh, we're not seeing the political appointments come on board as fast as we would like. So we are going to have the first meeting uh, the second uh, Tuesday of July, and that will be a regular monthly task force meeting. Uh, and we'll have in between those times work, working group meetings. And then ultimately the deliverable on January 15th of 2023, which I think is all really interesting because for all of us who have been following uh, the federal solicitation, uh, we all saw the notice of intent uh, that just came out. Um, and it really looks like ultimately the funding opportunity in it opportunity announcement will be due uh, from submissions sometime in March or April of next year. So the recommendations coming from this committee will go into the legislative process starting January of next year and the Energy and Technology Committee will consider those. If that makes Connecticut more competitive with our regional partners, uh, that will be uh, highly considered. So uh, why don't I stop there and uh, happy to uh, take questions. Thanks, Brian. So we did have a question come through already that um, asks, do we need to return the state of Connecticut campaign contribution certification form? Uh, that's part of Appendix B with the proposal. That's good. Yes, we do. That, that's an important uh, document. Um, 
if there are concerns that you have now about it, you know, I don't think we would not move forward without it in there. But uh, we'd like to, if, if you'd like to talk it through, Blair, I think with Brian, you know, our legal counsel, we can try to understand better where you're at and uh, uh, make some suggestions from there. Yeah, that would be suggested. I mean, typically we more so require that in connection with any contract resulting from a response to a proposal. But it would be safe for you guys to queue that up in advance. And again, we can explain any um, intricacies in connection with the same if any of you guys have any questions. Other questions? And feel free, this isn't the only time. We've got a few more few right. more days, so feel free to send in those questions too. Okay. <clears throat> here's here's a question. Will the task force meetings be in person or does the selected consultant need to have someone who can attend in person? Great question. So I think what we would like to do and what um, I'm going to do with the ex officio members is set up a meeting uh, work through how we're thinking about this monthly task force meetings, uh, working, you know, four different working groups with leaders uh, who might meet once or twice a month. Um, what I'd like to do with the task force meetings is have the option of both. You know, COVID is still around. Um, you know, folks are comfortable, not comfortable. Uh, but what I want to do is also show off the state. So I'd like to move these meetings around to, for example, uh, the Center for Clean Energy Engineering at UConn, uh, fuel cell, you know, in stores, fuel cell energy in Torrington and Danbury, you know, just kind of move it around a little bit so folks can really understand the ecosystem that we've created here in Connecticut. So that would require that, yes, there's some in-person element there, but every in-person element has to have an online capability so that we'll be able to have the meetings accessible both ways. Um, so I think in terms of, um, uh, you know, in-person participation from the consultant, uh, you know, you might indicate your preference uh, either way and, you know, you would cover travel and lodging, you know, just build that into your uh, uh, lodging budget um, so that we can see in your assumptions in terms of how you're thinking about it. You know, one person, two people at task forces and, and we'll look at it accordingly. Obviously, the preference would be in person, uh, but we recognize that in the times that we're in that uh, we have to safety uh, first. Great. Okay. So, next question. The, the purpose of the study is to understand the potential of hydrogen-fueled energy. Does that mean the study should not consider end uses of hydrogen outside of energy generation, uh, e.g. ammonia production? Also, should only end uses within the state be considered? So, these are great questions. And, um, what I would say is in your proposal, you should identify within you know, each of those seven areas questions for consideration because these are the things that the task force is gonna have to grapple with, right? Um, I think there are a lot of people who read statute literally and are like, this is what the legislature is telling us to respond to. But as we all know, there are gray areas and there's more information behind those things. So I would suggest that, you know, in your proposal, identifying some of the things that are underlying those questions would demonstrate your knowledge of uh, hydrogen as an industry. Um, then we would use that uh, with the winning bidder to help us have conversations and structure agendas with the task force to further uh, clarify the objectives of the working groups. Any other questions, folks? All right. Well, we're excited uh, by this. Uh, we know you all are excited. We, we, we can kind of see who you are. We're seeing all your work on hydrogen uh, across the country. These are exciting times. Um, you know, if you were in our offices, you would actually see the green hydrogen room. We have uh, one of our offices that celebrates Dr. Bernard Baker of Fuel Cell Energy, uh, really intended to, to symbolize the innovation uh, in Connecticut. And uh, whatever contractor we select, at some point when you're up, we'll show you around our office space and you can see that we're, we're big um, supporters of innovation 
uh, and want to encourage um, this task force to identify opportunities for Connecticut to continue its leadership on hydrogen and fuel cells. So uh, thank you all for being with us here today and uh, we're looking forward uh, to your proposals. Everyone have a good day.